Okay, so I'm just going to create a new Rails project, Rails new routing demo. And I, I've already created a new GitHub repository just so that when I post this up on YouTube, there'll be a GitHub repository to reference as well. So I'll just uh, do that step. You don't necessarily have to, if you're gonna code along with me, you don't necessarily need to have a GitHub remote for what we're doing. And once my new command runs, I'm gonna quickly git enable this folder and link it to the GitHub repository that I have waiting. So I'm gonna go to my routing demo. I'm gonna run my git remote to add myself as a remote. Um, and I'm using the SSH because I do have my public private key set up. What is it not like? Oh, I still need to do a git in it. So this is a git repository and now it has a remote on it. And now I'm going to add and commit uh, initial commit of a new Rails 4.1.6 project. So we're linked up. If I do a git log, we'll see one commit in it, which is the same commit we would see if we go to my remote and go to the commit log there. I have my one commit. I can now, I'm gonna use this one command window as the Rails server. So I'll run Rails S. And I've got a couple other command prompts that I can use to go to my routing demo folder. Three is usually the number, or number of command windows that I have open. One for the server, often one for a console, and one for git and um, other sort of rails or rake commands. And once that server's up and running, which usually doesn't take very long there, it's up and running on port 3000. I can now go to my local host and go to port 3000 and I'll get that welcome message. And this is just baked into Rails. There's no controller that that's doing this. This is just uh, something that's baked into Rails when there's nothing to a Rails project. There's nothing, there's no routes on the root. It just goes here automatically. So if I want to start demoing what routing does, I need something to route to, right? The whole point of the routing uh, system in Rails is to point URLs to particular controller actions. So for any demoing, I'm going to need a controller before I can actually start demoing routing because I need something to route to. So I not only need a controller, but I'm also gonna need controller actions if I want to route to something. And so, I'll, uh, I'll create a new controller and I'll do it with the Rails G command, G for generate. And I'm gonna generate a controller and uh, maybe I'll just call this controller um, pages. That's not a good, I always struggle at naming things. This is just gonna be a demo controller. It's going to demonstrate Rails routing. So I don't wanna call it routing. What should I call this controller? Xbox. <laughs> Xbox. Uh, that won't make any sense either. Uh, what's that? Xbox. Oh, <laughs> okay. But I'm still not going to call it Xbox controller, even though I now get the joke. Uh, I'm just going to call it demo. So it's just going to be a demo controller because it doesn't have a real purpose other than to demonstrate um, some routing. And this is going to not only create in my app controllers folder a new controller, it's also going to generate a view folder in the app views folder for any related views for this particular controller. So we will see, um, where's my project here? 
This is the routing demo. So in the app folder, we now have this demo controller. Notice there's also this application controller. We can look at both of them. So I'll bring them both into here. The demo controller is just a class. This was just generated for me when I ran that command. You can see even the, the output of the command that I ran uh, talked about creating the, yeah, right here, create app controllers demo controller. And here we have a class called demo controller. So notice the file name is in snake case demo underscore controller. The class name is in camel case capital demo capital controller. Uh, it inherits from application controller, which is this class right here. Often, or at least initially, this class will remain uh, fairly empty. You can see this class application controller inherits from something called action controller base. That should be somewhat reminiscent of what happens with active record for our models. Our models uh, inherit from something called active record base. The reason we have this sort of intermediary class here is that controllers, there's often functionality that you want to share amongst all of the controllers in your system. And to sort of utilize object orientation, specifically uh, inheritance, all controllers inherit from application controller. So you can put common functionality into the application controller file and have it shared across your various controllers by way of inheritance. So any classes, sorry, any methods that I put in here, either public or private, are going to, or public or protected, are going to be shared by this demo controller and any other controllers I make in my system. So it's just set up by default to, uh, because we know, and we as Rails programmers know that eventually we're going to have functionality shared across controllers, so we have a place to put it. So I'll close that up for now. And so now I have this particular demo class and I'll make an action inside of it and whenever I talk about an action in this course I just mean a method in a controller it's just a way of distinguishing because uh, you can have other methods in controllers that are like private but any action is something that a route gets mapped to we, we map routes to actions actions being public methods in controllers so here I'm going to define a new action and I'm going to name it uh, Wally Let's give it a nice friendly name and give it no content whatsoever and I'm also going to open up my routing file because that's where we actually set up routes and that's in my config folder it's something called routes.rb initially this routes.rb is full of sort of helpful examples in comments, but I'm going to remove them all because they are all just comments. So I just want you to see that to start with, the routing is, is empty. We have this command Rails. Rails is almost this sort of this master class that does a lot of uh, the grunt work for the Rails project in and of itself. Rails.application.routes draw do why things are named the way they are, like why it's called drawing a route, I'm not sure. Right? That's just something we take for granted in the Rails language. That's, that's what we do for our routing files. They all start with this command. And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to match a route to an action. And so to do this, we need to take a little bit of a chance to chat about HTTP. HTTP is a protocol where we use verbs to interact with URIs. HTTP gives us a number of verbs that let us interact with uniquely identified resources on the internet. And so a URI is a universal resource indicator, sometimes called a URL universal resource locator, but it's it's a unique address of something on the internet. And the verbs we can use uh, with HTTP, the most common uh, being get. There's also post. There's also uh, put and 
patch and delete and are there any others? Get post put patch delete. If there are, we'll uh, we'll come across them as we go. We're we're probably familiar with these two, right? Clicking links or putting links into URLs in the location bar of a of a web browser. That's a GET request. When we submit a form, that's typically a POST request. Although forms can be configured to submit by way of GET. So when you set up a form element in HTML. You can give it a method of get, and it will send those things by way of a get request. Uh, and both get requests and post requests can have parameters that uh, that are associated with those things. So parameters being some kind of user data. So those are those are our verbs. These our these are our HTTP verbs. Let me just take a quick peek to see if I've forgotten any. I'm going to hop over to the Rails routing guide. Get, post, get, patch, put, delete. Yeah, OK. Uh, and so the first step in creating a route is to specify which verb you want that route to trigger on. And so what I would like is I would like on my website, if I was to go to this is my website, slash Wally. I want to load up from this URI, this domain and path, I'd like to load up this Wally bit of code. I'd like this Wally code to execute. And so, and I'd like that to happen by way of a GET request. So by like, if I pressed enter here, that would be a GET request. Or if I had a link to this particular URI and I clicked it, that would be a GET request. So I'm going to say, I get. And then I start talking about the path now. And I don't bother including the initial slash. So I'm just talking about the path. So it's understood that the path starts in a slash. So I get to Wally is going to route to. And here I use like the hash rocket. So it's like we're setting up key uh, public, or sorry, with, like we're setting up key value pairs. Wally is going to route to. And then this string always has the same format. It's the name of the controller that we're routing to, which in our case is the demo controller, and the name of the action we're routing to, which is Wally. And that does it. That is sort of the, the, the simplest way to set up a route. Get Wally demo. So this here, if I was to uh, Set up a route that uh, route for a get to slash Wally. And then here I can put a comment in as well. That's the controller. That's the action. Um, maybe I won't write it like this thing. That's how this is formatted. I can now go to that particular route and trigger a GET request. It tells me that there's a template missing. So if you think about the flow of what's happening here, before we can ever get a response back to the end user, we have to have at least this path covered. Routing controller view layout server. This part of the loop is sort of the shortest way from inputting user request to outputting something. So we don't necessarily have to go to the model. We don't necessarily have to go to ERB. But we have to have routing that takes us to a controller that generates something for the end user to see, some kind of HTML that then gets injected into a layout and ends up back at our end user. What that means is by default, by default, Rails will attempt to load the associated view, which is in the app views demo folder. 
And so the name of this controller, demo, has a subfolder inside of views, and it's going to try to load up a file with the same name as the action. So this, again, Rails conventions. So same name, wally.html.erb. For test purposes, I can even um, short circuit that. I can say, well, just to test things are all wired up correctly, I can just try to render some text. Uh, hello, Wally. And that will actually uh, circumvent this default, uh, making the template just that straight up text. So let's see what happens if I go there. It says, hello, Wally. So now I've, I've linked up all the pieces. I've got routing, which is just a simple mapping of an HTTP verb, a path, and the endpoint of that path, a controller action. And in that controller action, I'm saying, well, we don't even need a view. Let's just render the text, hello, Wally. And that, in and of itself, let's see if it gets injected into a view or not at that point. Not even. Because I've circumvented it, just literally that text gets sent to the end user. That was just for demo purposes. I'm going to now allow it to actually load up, auto load up this page. So now I'm going to go and make that file. So in my demo folder, I have to go make that file. Wally.html.erb. And now I can give it some thing like an H2 in it that says, hello, Wally. And I need to save that demo controller too. View source. Not only is the hello Wally there inside of an H2, but now it actually is inside the context of a larger HTML document. So now we've properly closed this loop. We're routing to a controller action. We have an associated view named after the action. And that's being injected into a layout, which is in our app views layouts folder. And that gets sent off to the end server. Just do a quick check to see it's been a while since I've been over at Git, so I'll just sit say add commit. We now have a demo controller with one routed action slash view. Any questions about that? It seems like a lot of work just to show a web page, right? So if you were using like static HTML files, you would just go and put a web page into a particular path and have Apache load it up. Uh, if you were working with PHP, it would basically be the same. You would just put a file in a particular location and have the website loaded up. So for something like this, just loading up static text, you know, this is typically not what we would use Rails for. Rails is for building web applications. It's not uh, designed to simply, if you wanted to load up a bit of a few static files, right? Portions of your Rails website might involve loading a few static files, but usually if you're bringing Rails into the picture, you want more in your application. You want more than just loading up some static files. The conventions, it sometimes can be hard to know when there's a convention involved and when there isn't. So there's like a convention involved here where the name of the action defines the name of the view that's going to be loaded. Here though, in my, in my routing, there's no convention that states that I have to name my route after the name of the controller action. So if I wanted it, to be that a get request to slash glutton actually was what triggered my Wally action. Well, I can do that. So now I've mapped get glutton to that demo Wally. And so if I go back to my web page, the Wally route doesn't work anymore. 
And when you go in in Rails development mode, when you go to a route that doesn't exist, it actually shows you all the routes that do exist. So if you had like 10 different routes that were defined in your file, it would show them here. The error messages for Rails, um, the error messages you get with Rails try to provide as much information as they can to help you solve the problem. So it's telling you no route matches a get to slash Wally, but you do have these routes available. It looks like one of them is a get to slash Glutton. Let's try that one out. And that now routes to the Wally action. So not necessarily, it wasn't a convention and it wasn't needed to name this Wally and that Wally. I can have the name of my route differ from the name of the action. A route that we often want to create for all of our websites is the root route. Where to go if we provide no path at all. Right now it's this welcome aboard message. I can also say, well, maybe the route should route to the demos welcome message. I want my own welcome message, not the Rails default one, but one that I've put into the demo. And so I've now said root. And the format for setting up a root route is to say root2. And if you want to be consistent across uh, your routes, that style of setting up routes is, is permissible as well. So I can say a get glutton should route2. Glutton should still work. And now we should have a, a root route that is attempting to go to an action called welcome, which doesn't yet exist. So if I go to the root, either with or without the slash, action welcome could not be found. So it's trying to get to it. I can go over there. I can define it. And again, I could just render out some text here that said welcome just for testing purposes. It now says welcome, so I've closed that loop. I've got a route, I've got a controller action, and I'm circumventing the view by just rendering direct text. But I can also have it now loads app views demo welcome.html.erb. And I need to make that file. the welcome page. So now I have a welcome page and a Clutton page. Notice I'm interacting them all by way of the location. I'm, lo I'm manually changing things in the location bar, which is if we're building a web app, not what we want our users to have to do, right? We want to build a website where we have links to click on. And so I want to be able to perhaps connect these two things. I'd like maybe in my welcome I'd like to be able to link to Wally and in Wally link to welcome. So I might, you know, manually do that, which is typically what we don't do in Rails, but let's just do it for the sake of it. So welcome slash slash glutton Wally's page. There's manually building Notice I don't have to do a whole path. I can just do the relative path slash glutton. And then he, over here, I can do the same thing. Just go to the root, the home page. I go back here. I can now go back and forth between those two pages by way of these links. But having manually done this, is going to be somewhat inflexible for my code. Remember, I can change my routing file at any time, so maybe this really should have been slash Wally. Okay, it should have been slash Wally. 
which means that that should now work. But on my home page, clicking this Wally's page link doesn't work anymore because it goes to the old one. And so we don't want to have to, every time we change a route, change our views to update all of these paths that we've hard coded in. I'm just going to name my route. I'm going to say this route actually has a name and it's called Wally. This route has a name by default and it's called root. Name does root. And again, I, I can name it anything. It doesn't have to be called Wally, but it just makes sense to because the path is Wally, the action is Wally, so I'm just going to name it Wally. And then in my two different view files, instead of manually building these links, I'm going to use the built-in link to helper. So maybe I'll put them inside of a paragraph tag and I'll say in ERB, so less than percent equals for an echo, meaning I want to inject something into my view. I want to link to first parameter is the contents of the link. I'll make this a quote so I can have a single in there. And where I want to link to, well, I don't want to just do this. This would work. I could, again, hard code in slash Clutton. But the whole point was that I don't want to be hard coding something into my, my code. I have a route called Wally. So what do I want to route to? Well, I want to route to the Wally underscore path, just the name of the route underscore path. And on the other side of things, in the other view, I can have a similar setup here. I can take those and I can paste them in here. And now a link to here is going to be a link to the home page. And instead of linking to the Wally path, the name of this route is root. So I'm going to link to the root path. And so now, no matter what I've set up for the path portion of this URI, my welcome is always going to correctly path to that route. So not only does routing give us the capability of interpreting URLs and mapping them con to controller actions, routing is also used inside of our view to allow us to build links to other routes that exist in our system. So routing is, an, is a sort of a receiving process where it receives routes and maps, but it's also a generation process that generates the correct routes for us within our view. And so if I go back to my code, we'll look at those one last time. Welcome has now a link to, the link text is gonna read Wally's page, and we're linking to the Wally path, where the Wally path was defined here as Wally. And then Wally just links back to the root path. And the root path was defined here when we did our root two. Back over at the actual application, I now have a system where I can link between those two paths, slash root and slash Wally. I can now go into my routing file and I can change this to whatever I want and my application still works. This could be called uh, really long path name. And now if I go back to my home page, it now links back and forth between slash and really long path name. I could even just make like ridiculous long routes and it would still work. Another part, one more, again. And my application still works. So we have this huge flexibility now over what URLs get mapped to code. Now it's unlikely that we would ever have built up a path like this really long for just the sake of it, but it's possible. And my application doesn't skip a beat. It knows what to route to because it's just naming to an, it's linking to a named route. So it doesn't matter what that path actually looks like. It has a name.
Wally, which is all that matters here. So whatever the Wally path is, build a link to it. So I will save those changes now. And multiple things could even like even link to the same bit of code. So there'd be nothing stopping me from also setting up, you know, the same kind of route, which just went back to Wally again. It'd be very unlikely though that I would have uh, multiple named uh, routes that led to the same location. But the, the possibility is there. Any questions about that? The fact that we're just we can do the mapping both ways. We set up which paths map to which controller actions, and then inside of our views, we use the link to command to link to those paths that we've named. We can also have the users sort of pass us information by way of these, these actual paths. And up to this point, we've only had static portions of our route. Everything here is a static portion, meaning you change a single character even and the route won't match. But I can have dynamic portions as well. And so I could have a route uh, that said get. And here we're going to just give it a, a name, a name for my route. And let's call this cheese. And we're going to say that the cheese is going to route to demo cheese as cheese and so okay slash cheese I get request to slash cheese should load up the demo cheese as cheese and so naming it I then need to have not only an action to route to but also a view which I will put here open that up followed the same process defined my route by way of an HTTP verb, the path, where it routes to, the name of said route. The action now exists, so does this view. I should be able to go to slash cheese manually and see it. Nothing dynamic yet, but now I'm going to add a dynamic component to it. And so I can add a slash. So we still use slashes as if we were going to some sort of path. But there's, these are no longer file system paths. They're just portions of uh, a URL. And some of those portions can be static, like cheese. And some of them can be dynamic, like maybe I put the word type there. Oops. And so now slash cheese slash anything is going to go and link us to here. So just going to slash cheese goes nowhere. There's no route that matches slash cheese, but there is a route that matches slash cheese slash something called type. Like a uh, type of cheese, which is like, I don't know, cheddar. But it could also be like Swiss cheese. Slash cheese slash anything, even slash cheese slash 42. Will take us to that because we've mapped that as our route. We've said that our route should any get request to slash cheese slash something should now load this up. The key here is that this something can be different values and we can actually know those different values here 
inside of my controller, I could create something called uh, cheese type. Remember the instance variables that are defined inside of my controller are shared with my view. And now I have this thing called the params hash, which is where the dynamic pieces of my route are going to end up. So if I look at the params at position type and save that into cheese type, inside of my view, I can say something like, uh, instead of a paragraph tag, oh, I see you like cheese type. And that should be at, because it's an instance variable. Period. So dynamically injecting the contents of the cheese type variable into my view, that cheese type variable being that dynamic portion of my URL. So the router said, we're going to have cheese slash something called type. Starts with a colon. We're retrieving in here from our params hash. Cheese slash 42 now says, oh, I see you like 42. Swiss. Maybe just say I say cheese. Go back here. I see you like Swiss cheese. I see you like cheddar cheese. That's a dynamic portion of our URL. It can change. It can change based on the users. In this case, it's just the users uh, typing things in, or it's just me typing things into the URL. But we could also have a series of links, each one of them linking to a different type of cheese and each going to a dynamically generated page that might reflect that type of cheese. The most common use of these dynamic portions of a URL might be to specify a resource inside of a database. So instead of just saying or talking about a type of cheese, it might actually be that I'm trying to find a particular type of cheese in my database. And so imagine I had a model called cheeses, or cheese, which would have a table of cheeses. And so Rails generate model cheese, and cheese is just going to have a name, which will be a string, and a description, description which will be text and um, a color, which will be a string, and a um, sharpness value, which will be an integer. You know, like things that the cheese might have. So that will generate for me not only the model, but the migration to generate the cheeses database table. And so to generate that actual table, I would do a rake db migrate. The rake db migrate runs my migration. So it's actually going to generate that cheeses table for me based on this definition of a cheese having a name, a description, color, and sharpness. So I'm going to end up with a database table called cheeses that has a name column, a description column, a color column, and a sharpness column, as well as an ID, which is an auto-incrementing primary key, and I might create it at and update it at timestamps. And now I can go to, for example, the Rails console, and I can start putting some cheese in there. The whole point of this being that I might want to, instead of having the user type in cheese, I might want them to be able to see individual cheeses from my database by way of an ID. So slash cheese, and I'm going to make it like cheeses, slash ID. And here, I'm going to say, OK, well, we've actually now, we're actually going to find a particular cheese from my cheese model, and I'm going to find by, I don't have a type anymore, but I do have a URL that's going to provide an ID. So if I set up a route, 
slash cheese slash ID, I can now pass IDs by way of a URL, get that value into the params hash, get that into a call to my model, and load up individual rows from my from my database table for display over here. And now it's going to be something like cheese.name, a property on the object of cheese that I've retrieved from my database here. I need some cheeses so I can create them. Uh, cheese.create a name a cheddar. I won't bother with the other properties right now. We don't have any validations on, so that's fine. I now have two cheeses in my database table. Uh, Cheese.first.id, you can see has an ID of one. The second one should have an ID of two, so the last cheese in my database table has an ID of two. I should now be able to actually retrieve these cheeses by way of my route. So slash cheeses slash some ID where I specify a numeric value. That numeric value will now be used to find a particular cheese and display it on the web. So instead of being now a type here, I would put a numeric value in. Oh, and I changed my route to be pluralized. So it'll be slash cheeses slash one. Oh, I see you like cheddar cheese, Swiss cheese when I changed it to two, an ID that doesn't exist in my database. Well, I couldn't find that ID. Record not found. Same thing that goes if it was like a non-numeric value. If I wanted to force numeric values upon my URLs, I could go and add a constraint And the constraint would look something like this. Oops. Not like that, like this. Copy, paste. And we can use regular expressions to add constraints to particular dynamic portions of our. URL ID is now constrained to be, and this is a regular expression that specifies a decimal number. And so trying to go to something which is not a numeric value, maybe I need to save that. Yeah. What don't you like? Anchor characters are not allowed. Oh, okay. Why would you have that in your documents then? No method error, yeah. demo cheese. So do you have a method of cheese in your demo controller? Yeah. Okay, let me take a peek then. And on my welcome page, I could do something like load up all those cheeses into a cheeses variable. And I could use some ERB to do a cheeses.each with a do. Cheese and here my end for each cheese. I can you know make an li. We've seen this before. Echoing out each cheese name. So that's for the welcome page, which was the root. 
was cheeses. So typos will get you every time in Rails, right? So I retrieved all of the cheeses into a variable called cheeses. So of course I have to actually use that cheeses variable inside of my view. And now I have my list of cheeses. If I were to add more cheese from the command prompt, right? Cheese.create another cheese named um, Gorgonzola. There it is. And if I wanted to link to the individual pages that display information about those cheeses, that's going to sort of wrap things all sort of up nicely here. I've got these routes that have a name of cheese. So I've named them. And we saw that with the names, I could do things like linking to the Wally path or linking to the root path. I should be able to link to the cheese path as well. And so if I want to link to, first parameter being the name of my link, and what do I want to link to? I want to link to the cheese path. I can't just type that because there's a different path for every cheese. It's the cheese path for this particular cheese. Okay, so I just pass that particular cheese in. And Rails will now do the rest of the routing for me. And so back over here, I have links to all my different types of cheeses. Clicking this one takes me to that cheese. Swiss. Gorgonzola. And it builds the correct URL structure for me. And again, I can go in and mess with my routing. I could, you know, these... These routes are very flexible. Uh, you know, for some reason, if I wanted to be very explicit and have the word show afterwards, so what I'm doing here is showing cheeses. Uh, now I could go back over here, and each one of these links now has show at the end of it, properly mapping to my correct route. I don't have to go into my view and rewrite any of those links because all I did in my view was asked for a link to the cheese path for a particular cheese. Because a particular cheese has a property of ID, the ID in the generated URL just gets auto-created for us. That was just a demonstration, though. I'm going to get rid of that show. So far, we've only used one of these verbs. You could start to imagine, though, when you might use the others. If you had a portion of your Rails application that included a form, you might make a route that would be able to receive the posted form. So you might have one route, a get route, for displaying the form. And then you might have one route being a post route for retrieving the data from that form. and doing something with it in a particular controller action. You might take that data and say you had a comment form. You might then take the posted comment and add it to a comments table. Just want to check to see if I've mentioned everything that I sort of wanted to cover as far as routing goes. For debugging these things, if you if you put in a route that doesn't exist, you always get to see the routes that do exist. So a really quick way of pulling up your list of routes, a slow way of doing it is running rake routes from the command prompt. So running rake routes here will parse out your routing file and eventually spit back to you a listing of all the routes that are in your system. But just going to a route that doesn't exist in your browser does the same thing. It pulls up all of your routes here. The name of the helper that's used to get to them, so when we used Wally path or cheese path or root path, the name of the helpers are right there. The verbs they respond to, the URLs they respond to, or the path portion of the URL that they respond to, and then the controller actions that they actually map to are all shown when we put in an invalid route. So that's a good way of debugging these things. When you do scaffolding, Rails builds a whole bunch of routes for you. Here, 
I defined some information about cheeses. What if I needed to do all sorts of things with cheeses, not just display them, but I needed to do like the full crud suite of things with cheeses, create them, read them, update, delete them. I could go and start building out routes for all of those things. So I might have a route just called uh, cheeses all on its own. And maybe I went and even went and created a whole new cheeses controller. So I might have a cheeses controller uh, index. And I might, so that would be slash cheeses. See all the cheeses? This might be my route. See an individual cheese? This might be my route. To like create a new cheese, I might have uh, cheeses slash new, which would take me to a form brought up by the new action. And then when that form was actually submitted, I might have a post to retrieve that at cheeses slash create. No, I might just post it to plain old cheeses and have that call cheeses create. So I would need to map out a whole bunch of routes to be able to do all my crud stuff. These routes are so common, right? Web browsers do crud so often and our crud is so uniformly the same application to application, resource by resource, that we can just say, well, Rails, why don't you just build for me all of the uh, resource routes that one will require for cheeses. And now when I put in a path that doesn't exist, you can see that Rails has created paths for me for all of my CRUD stuff. Because that CRUD stuff is so uniform. So there's something that maps to the cheeses index action. There's something that maps to the cheeses create action, new, edit, show. There's two updates that destroy. All of my CRUD tasks are covered off here. Some of them in pairs, new being paired with create, edit being paired with update. But I don't have to write all of these routes myself. I just use this one command. If I want to pick and choose, I could say, well, I want to work with cheeses, but I'm only really going to be working with them in the context of display. So I need like an index and a show generated for me only. Okay, so it'll build that for you. Routes for an index and show. And that just gives us a consistency of style of pathing for CRUD in Rails. So I can do only, and I can also do like something like accept. So I can say, well, build me all of the CRUD routes, except for I don't want the outside world to be able to delete. So I get, oh, it should be destroy, I guess. Accept destroy. And then it builds for me all of them, except for destroy. Now, none of them would work at this point, because I don't actually have a cheeses controller, but I could go create one and start working with it. So some of what we do for Rails routing is manually setting up with name of verb, you know, path to some particular controller action. And some of it, if we're just working with resources, is just relying on Rails to auto-generate routes for us. All of them accept a particular action, only particular actions, or the whole, the whole crud, all crud routes will be defined. And it makes it so that Rails applications, URL-wise, all tend to look the same. And that's that's a good thing, right? So you, you tend to have a familiarity of, with the URLs that are involved in a Rails application if you're relying on the resources to auto-build your routes for you. And I think that's where I'm going to stop for today because we've probably absorbed enough about Rails routing. One last look at this picture. Stare at it and feel happy that you now know how this box links to this one that links to this one. We've gone this short path around the request.